All right, guys, so what we're going to be talking about here is what is known as power series convergence. Now, previously, we kind of looked at what a power series was. Now we're going to be talking a little bit about more when we can use, what, what we can do with a power series as we get a little bit further into it. There are power series that are very important, but in order for us to do that, there are certain limitations that we have to realize about power series. And in order to do that, let, let's talk about this a little bit. Let's say we had a series that only dealt with constant numbers. Now, remember, when we introduce power series, all of a sudden we're saying, okay, there are X values in our infinite series. But that doesn't change a ton about what's going on. Instead, we just it, it makes them look more complicated. But in reality, when we were looking at series, remember, we said, okay, I have these series, I want to know whether or not it converges, and there were a bunch of different terms, there were a bunch of different tests we could look at. There was like the alternating series test, we had the ratio test, we had whether or not it was a p-series, but that, that told us that like, we just had to look at the power at, at which the number was being raised to on the bottom. Uh, we had uh, like a, we could come with the limit comparison test, the direct comparison test. All of those were different tests that we could use to tell whether or not a series was convergent or divergent when it didn't have X values. And after you do enough of those problems when it just has numbers in it, infinite series tend to be not super easy, but it becomes easier to tell whether or not a, a one of those series is going to be convergent or divergent. Now you might be asking yourself, okay, well, how does that help me with a power series? Well, with a power series, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, I've got this series, but now it has variables in it and it's representing a different series, and I might not know exactly how to evaluate that series. That's why I have this power series here. The problem with a power series is they work, like they, and they're very good represent polynomial representations of, of different types of functions, but they might not always work for every single value of x, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but what we have to do once we create a power series is we have to say, okay, what X values can I plug in and have it give me the same X, the same value out as if I were plugging in an X value into that same function. Once we, once we find out what those X values are, we are discovering what is known as an interval of convergence. And an interval of convergence is very important because it allows us to know, okay, I've got this power series has x's in it, it's a polynomial that represents a different function that wasn't a polynomial, but I need to know what x values can I plug in so that I get the same value from the original function versus this polynomial that I've just created. So here's one example. Let's say I had x minus 2 to the nth power in my infinite series. For n equals 0 to infinity of x minus 2 to the nth power, and I've got 1 over 1 minus x, 1 over 1 minus x minus 2, and you're like, wait a second, why is that? If I think about this, if I put in 0 for n, not for x, but for n, I get 1 plus x minus 2 plus x minus 2 squared, on and on and on. And I can say, wait a minute, to get from the first term to the second term, I multiplied by x minus 2. From the second term to the third term, I multiplied by x minus 2. And that pattern would repeat on and on and on, which means we have a geometric series. Now, when we looked at geometric series before, the nice thing about a geometric series is we could tell exactly what it added up to, and that was this formula right here. But one thing had to be true in order for us to be able to tell what it, whether or not it was convergent or divergent. And that was that, that common ratio that we were looking at as we went from one term to the next had to be less than one. And it was actually the absolute value of that common ratio had to be less than one. Well, if I look at this and I'm like, well, my common ratio this time, it's a little bit different, okay? So my common ratio in this case is x minus two. So what this is saying is the absolute value of x minus two has to be less than one. If that statement is true, then we know that our power series that we have just created, whatever x values make the statement true is probably a better way to say it, those will create our interval of convergence. That'll give us all of the x values that we need to make sure that our series is convergent. It's probably been a while since we've dealt with absolute values before when we're solving. So the way that we do that is we go, we copy down exactly what we see with the less than sign. Then on the other side, we put greater than negative one, and then we just solve for x. So I'm going to add two to every to all sides here. So I get 1 is less than x is less than 3. 
Since that is the case, what this is saying is this function over here, 1 over 1 minus x minus 2, which could be simplified down to 1 over 3 minus x if I wanted to, and this infinite series right here, x minus 2 to the nth power, if I take any number between 1 and 3, any x value I want at all, and I put that number in for x there, and I put it in for x there, those will give me the same answer because it will give me a convergent answer. Past that, it might not do that because we're no longer in our interval of convergence, which means I'm looking at a divergent series. So technically, this would be infinity here. I couldn't find out what that adds up to. Now, you might be saying, okay, well, why am I finding this interval of convergence? Again, we'll get to why we're doing this, but it's important to understand that we can find this interval of convergence. Now, you might also be saying right now, wait a second, not all series that we look at, like that was pretty simple. That was a geometric series, and we were kind of able to see that, but not all series are geometric series. So any other series, and quite honestly, this is what you do probably 99% of the time. You could actually do this instead of doing the geometric series. It's just a little bit more difficult. And that is we could use the ratio test. The ratio test, you remember, what we do is we do the limit as n approaches infinity of this is just saying our some term and then the term that comes right after it. So we make ourselves a fraction out of those two. And when we do that, we're going to get a number of some sort. If you remember, if it was that number was less than one, the series was convergent. If it was greater than one, it was divergent. And if it was equal to one, which does not happen very often, we would have to use a different test because the test was inconclusive. And most of the time we came back and used the integral test instead, although that very rarely appears. Okay, so we've, we've got the ratio test that we used back when there were no x values in our, to tell whether or not our series, infinite series was going to be convergent. Well, what is nice about the ratio test is we can say, you know what, using that formula, I can actually find an interval of convergence. And rather than having me try to explain it, let me show you how that works. So I've got this series right here. It's an infinite series. I've got n times x to the nth over 3 to the n plus 1. This is not a geometric series because I've got that n in there. So I can't just use that, do the same thing that I did previously. Instead, what I could do is I could do, okay, the limit as n approaches infinity, I'm going to, whoops, that's supposed to be infinity. I'm going to be using the ratio test here. Now, remember the ratio test says n plus 1 multiplied by x to the n plus 1 over 3 to the n plus 1 plus 1 divided by basically the general term. So what I'm saying here is we're not plugging numbers in for x. We're just saying, okay, I'm going to choose two random numbers or two random terms in my infinite series, and it's going to be way out there. That's why I have the limit as n approaches infinity. And I want to see what happens. So I'm going to have n times x to the n divided by 3 to the n plus 1. Now, if this were not a power series, what would happen here is we'd say, okay, I want that to, I want to know what number I get out here, and I want to see whether that is less than 1. The problem here is I have x's in my limit, and so I don't know what number I'm going to get. All I know is when I put those x values in, I want them to be less than 1. So you're looking at this, I'm like, you're, you're probably saying, how in the world am I ever going to simplify that down to even figure out what x values I can use? So what we're going to do is we've got a fraction over a fraction. Remember, I can do the fraction that's on top. So I'm going to change that to 3n plus 2 multiplied by the reciprocal of the fraction that's on the bottom. If you don't remember that, just come and talk to me and we can, I can explain why that works. And I want that to be less than 1. Now, a quick side note here. When you're taking the AP test, in order to get full credit, because these show up all the time on the AP test, in order to get full credit on a question like this, there's a couple things I want to call your attention to. Number one, and this is the first thing I'm going to say, is you cannot forget your limit notation. You forget that, you're going to lose a point, and that's just a dumb point to lose. There's another one coming up here in just a second that also deals with the limit that we cannot forget as well. Now, we look at this, and we're like, wait a minute. On the bottom, there are n plus 2 3s multiplying together, and on the top, there are n plus 1 3s. Well, those are going to cancel, and I'm just going to be left with 1, 3 on the bottom, okay? So that was kind of nice. And then there's n plus 1 x's on the top, and there's just one, there's just x n's on the bottom, so I'm going to have 1 x left on the top. 
Now we do have to be a little bit careful because I've got n plus one here and I've got n here. Those do not cancel. And one thing you never want to do, this is the limit as n approaches infinity and we've still got that absolute value, so that's less than one, is now I want to evaluate the limit. Now one thing, and this is the second thing where you lose points if you do this, do not plug infinity in for n. Once you do that, you're saying that this is a, a, an algebraic statement that we do not want to do. Instead, just realize what is happening as I do the limit as n approaches infinity. Those two basically cancel each other out, and this just becomes x divided by 3 is less than 1. Now, again, it doesn't seem like that's that big of a deal, but it's important that you don't plug infinity in for n. Once we do that, I've got x, I multiply by 3, and now I have what is known as an interval of convergence. So any number that I put in between negative 3 and positive 3 on my, inner, on my in for x, excuse me, in for that number right there, I will have a convergent series. So I can only use x's between negative 3 and positive 3. Now this might not seem like a really big deal, but it's important that we understand how to do this as we get further into power series and how to construct them. Another thing that we need to talk about, remember on our last problem we had that x is between negative 3 and positive 3. Now we'll get a little bit close, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but when we talk about where a series is centered, we discussed it briefly, how far we can go in either direction from where the series is centered is what is known as our radius of convergence. A lot of times what you'll see is you'll get to a problem, you'll do a problem, you'll get to a point like this where the absolute value of x is less than 3. Before you drop the absolute value signs, or when you get to this point right here and you have x plus or minus a number right here, you've got numbers on either side, so it'll be like negative 3 to positive 3. How far away from where our series is centered is what is known as the radius of convergence, okay? So whatever that number is, like it, when you have the absolute value, you can tell your radius of convergence. So for example, if my series went from negative 4 to positive 6, so I was over here from negative 4, my, my interval of convergence, negative 4 over to positive 6, notice that there is a distance of 10 between those two numbers. Each of those numbers is the same distance away from where the series is centered, so if they're 10 away from each other, that means each of them would be 5 away from where the series is centered. So this series would be centered at positive 1. So I'd go over here, over here, 5 in either direction, which would mean my radius of convergence is equal to 5. Conversely, if I knew a series was centered at 1, so I was at 1 right here, and I knew my radius was 3 in either direction, so 3 in this direction would take me to negative 2, 3 in this direction would take me to 4, I would know my interval of convergence goes from negative 2 to positive 4. Those show up a little bit on the AP test, not a lot, but a little bit, so just understand what those are. If you have any questions about that one, just come and talk to me, we can talk about that as well. So let's look at one more example, we'll get plenty of chances to do this in further lessons, but let's take a look at this one, okay, let's do... Again, our limit as n approaches infinity of, I've got 10 to the n plus 1. I know this is not a geometric series, so I'm going right to the ratio test. x plus 1 to the n plus 1 power multiplied by n plus 1 factorial, or divided by n plus 1 factorial. And I'm going to flip this one upside down right now. I'm going to take my general term and just flip it upside down like that. And I want that to be less than 1. Well, just like last time, let's see what cancels. So I've got 10 on the top. I've got x minus 1 on the top as well. Then I've got that multiplied by n factorial over n plus 1 factorial. And we dealt with these briefly before. So I've still got that limit there. This is canceled out quite a bit. Now we need to take care of the n part. We can't solve for x until the n's go away. Well, remember, n plus 1 factorial is n plus 1 multiplied by n factorial. So the n factorials cancel out, and I've got 1 over n plus 1. Well, the limit as n approaches infinity, again, don't plug it in. Don't put 1 divided by infinity, but realize that that is 0. So 0 multiplied by 10 times x minus 1 is less than 1 gives me a statement of 0 is less than 1. 
Well, zero is always less than one. That's always a true statement. So if you run into a problem like this, I could say, I'm going to talk about my interval first. My series is centered at one here, but I can plug in any X value I want, and this series is going to be convergent. So from negative infinity to positive infinity would be my interval of convergence. Similarly, my radius of convergence, because I can go as far away from one as I want in either direction, my radius is also going to be infinity. Now that doesn't always happen, but it just so happened in this case, and it does happen sometimes. Some functions come out so nicely that when you look at them, you're like, oh, I can use this and any X value that I plug in for X right there, just for X, I am going to get a convergent series no matter what, which is really nice. We will discuss radius of interval of convergence more in the next section because there's a little bit more to the interval of convergence than what we've talked about right now. But hopefully this has made sense so far. And so this is one of the more complicated ideas that we talk about. But if you have any questions about this, please let me know.